haven't you heard that your creator never grows weary? And as a God who never grows weary, he is a source of unending strength. Dear Heavenly Father, I love this brother so much. And I just ask you, Lord, to give him words today, God, that we need to hear. It's our heart to serve you. It's our heart to that all of our children and all of our lives and would just want to be inspired by your spirit to do what you want your way. And so, God, I just pray that you be with Brother Daniel and give him unction, Lord. Give him words, oh God, from heaven that will, that will move us and change us to do the things that you want us to do and speak to our hearts, Lord, and prepare a place in our hearts, Lord, and sanctify us for your work. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brother. Greetings in Jesus' name to all of you uh, this evening. And thank you for coming and giving me the opportunity to share. I thank you for those kind words, Brother Dean. And um, it is my prayer that all the young people that come to Ghana would come back with fire in their eyes and that uh, that would remain. <clears throat> I don't know most of you here tonight. I know a few people. But I'm just trusting that what the Lord has laid on my heart is what is appropriate or what your heart needs to hear from the Word of God. I got a feeling listening to the singing that maybe you're just slightly more noisy than some American churches. And uh, I don't mean your children. I mean <laughs> you responding to the Word of God. If you are, please um, feel free. That's, uh, this is a young man who spent his entire preaching life in Africa, and I face a fairly significant amount of culture shock when I come back to the States to preach. Uh, my African churches are very interactive, almost conversational while I preach, and uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a jump. I was preaching a couple Sundays ago, I won't mention the church, I don't mean to shame anyone, but I was preaching and I, I, I reached the crescendo of the message and I, I just got it out there. And there was this awkward silence and I, I, before I could even think, I said, I'm sorry, I thought there would be a response. <laughs> it, it just came out. And then people kept apologizing after the service. We loved your message. We're sorry we're so quiet. And I was not in any way trying to make someone feel bad. It, it was simply the, the cultural expectation that this is the high point of the message. And surely if they get this, something will come out of them. So if, if you are that kind of people and if you're a little bit freer, please feel free to respond. You will bless me. You will not shock me. I wonder if we realize the treasure that we have in the songs that we sang this evening. I almost feel like if we really grasped the words of what we're singing, I wouldn't need to preach. They are so filled with power. What we need to lay down, what we need to pick up, how we can keep going forward, what needs to stay in front of our eyes while we pursue uh, the glory of God. But I'll just pick out one phrase just because they're all so beautiful. The last verse of, am I a soldier of the cross? Sorry, verse 4. Um, I, like Brother Dean, I, I grew up in the home of a father who had been in the military. And uh, I like military songs with the martial air. And I think that the church needs a bit more of a martial air. I think we do because the glory of God needs some soldiers. And I think we're going to need it if we're going to make it through what's probably coming to our nation in the years to come. Verse 4 says, Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. It's been a little while since America has had a war where people signed up in their numbers because they wanted to fight. And I agree with you that fighting for the kingdoms of this world is not what God wants his people to be involved in. But if Paul 
could draw lessons from the athletes of his day, we surely should be able to draw lessons from the historical realities of soldiers. And the fact that, particularly in World War II, soldiers wanted to fight. That verse should not be, sure, I, I must fight if I would gain. It should be, sure, I must fight if I would gain. Always the church has gained through fighting. So if we expect to gain and win, then sure, I must fight Amen. if I would gain. I study a lot of World War II history because I draw a lot of lessons from it. And history records for us that young men had tricks that they employed to try to pass the tests to get into the American military. There were young men whose eyes were not good enough to be gunners. And there were these, you know, potions that were passed, along, passed around among the soldiers that if you take this, it'll improve your eyesight enough to pass the test. I'm not encouraging cheating, but look at the spirit behind that. There were young men who were too short to, shine, to sign up for the American military. And I understand this is true medically. If you hang upside down, you can gain about three quarters of an inch. It won't be permanent for any of you children that wish to be taller. <laughs> it will not be permanent, but it might last long enough to, to sign up for the military. And somehow the picture of that just brings so much emotion into my heart because I, I long for a day when the church of Jesus Christ would be at that, would have that type of loyalty in our hearts that we would be trying to figure out how can I possibly sign up for a difficult spot? Amen. Hang upside down. And I just have this picture of these young men who knew they weren't tall enough to be soldiers standing in line at the recruiting office and trying their best to be tall enough because they wanted to fight instead of coming up with just as many excuses as they possibly could to stay home. The children of darkness are wiser in their generation than the children of light. And I hope that we can be inspired to fight. When that illustrious day shall rise and all thy armies shine, that day is coming. Paul says, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you into his glorious kingdom. I can't wait for that entrance. Amen. I'd like to share with you tonight um, on the topic of weary yet pursuing. Weary yet pursuing. Brother Dean uh, mentioned very kindly that we've been on the field for many years. And um, I'm sharing with you tonight what God is ministering to my heart right now. If you asked for a description of where I am in my heart right now, it would be the title of this message, Weary Yet Pursuing. And let's turn to the book of Judges to get our text or verses for this evening. The book of Judges and chapter 8. I just want to walk us through a little bit of the story of Gideon. We're not going to go through the entire story. I'm, I'm expecting and trusting that we know the history of Gideon and how God called him a very unlikely man from a physical perspective, from the perspective of being a general in God's army. Um, Gideon was not the person that might have been chosen first. We understand how God called him. And when God called him, Gideon's initial response was, I think you're speaking to the, to the wrong person. I think there must be someone standing behind me. I kind of get the picture when the angel greeted Gideon with, Hail, thou mighty man of valor. I kind of get the picture that Gideon looked behind him like, Obviously there is a man of valor standing behind me because it cannot be possible that that angel is speaking to me, the fearful little Gideon who's hiding from the Midianites, threshing out a little bit of grain in secret. 
And he, he tried to explain to the angel. He said, look, I, I'm, I'm an Israelite. We're already underneath the Midianites. I'm from a low tribe in, in a nation which is under the Midianites. And I'm from a family which is not well respected in that low tribe. And I happen to be the least of my father's family. And the angel responded, go in this thy might. And I'm sure Gideon was wondering which might. We understand the story of Gideon and how God used him to call out the children of Israel, the, a, large, a, a large army for maybe for that time in Israel's history, but a small army compared to the Midianite horde that they were up against and how God decreased that army twice until there were only 300 people who were fighting with Gideon that night. And we have this amazing story of how God sent Gideon down to listen in on the dreams of the enemy so that Gideon's heart would be strengthened. And God gave him this strategy of having these 300 men holding pitchers with fire in the pitchers and that, that entire story of how God used that cacophony of noise to sow discord and, and fear and let the Midianites start fighting against themselves. And a great victory was won there. But the fact that that great victory was won there doesn't take away from the fact that Gideon was awake all night. And I don't know how many nights before the night of the attack Gideon had been awake. But I'm kind of guessing that he was awake, worrying, thinking, praying, fearing, talking to God. We understand the, we, we know the story of the fleeces that he put out there. I think there was a lot of sleepless nights going into this night of the attack. And then while God brought a great victory, the, the 300 men that were with Gideon did have to fight and chase. And so after chasing the Midianites and, and winning a very great victory, we break in here in Judges chapter 8. And we will start reading in verse 4. And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over. He and 300 men that were with him, faint, yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Succoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint. And I am pursuing after Zeba and Zelmana, kings of Midian. And we'll stop there. We'll just look at those two verses. It is from this verse 4 that we draw our title, Weary Yet Pursuing. The word faint can be um, looked at in a couple of different ways. You can use the word weary, exhausted, or faint. I think Gideon and his men were tired to the point of exhaustion. I think they were hungry to the point of fainting. I think that they had ran after the Midianites all night long and now the sun is coming up and they reach the Jordan River at a place of utter, utter weariness. And yet the Bible records for us that they crossed the Jordan River weary but still pursuing. There are many different sources of weariness that can come into our lives. And I don't know you well enough to know what your sources of weariness might be. It may be that I am uniquely facing weariness after my years in Africa. But I believe that there are numerous things that bring weariness into the lives of, of the church. And as I have traveled across the United States for the last um, eight weeks and preached in different places and interacted with believers... I see many signs of weariness in God's people. And my desire tonight is to use these verses and the encouragement that they have been to my heart to be an encouragement to you, as well as a couple of other portions of Scripture. I want you to picture with me, I think it's very important that we try to picture this scene well. There's a reason why Scripture records this as a story. Have you thought about that? Because th there could have simply been a Bible verse here encouraging us uh, to not stop. There could be maybe the New Testament verse, be not weary in well-doing. But here, God records for us the story of Gideon, and I believe we're supposed to picture it. And certainly for me, the, the strength and encouragement that has come into my heart has come from picturing Gideon and these 300 men. I wonder if you've ever been to a place of utter physical exhaustion in your life. As a family, about um, 
Two years ago, we took a family trip and went down to the southern part of Ghana, an area we'd never been in before, and we heard there was a really beautiful waterfall that you had to hike into the mountains to, 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 to see. When I looked it up on uh, Google, it said three hour round trip hike. So we set out early in the morning one morning with a small water bottle for each of us and one little bag of, of a snack to eat on this three hour hike. It took us five hours to get to the waterfall. And our water was gone and our snacks were gone and we realized we still had five hours to go back. But we knew that the sun was going to go down. The sun, we only have about 12 hours of daylight and we were, you know, moving towards afternoon. By the time our family stumbled back out of the hills, we were exhausted. We were thirsty, we were weak, we were tired, we were exhausted. I'm sure that's nothing compared to what Gideon and his men experienced. Running all night, the adrenaline of the fight, the thrill of the victory, the exertion of chasing, running after this army of, of Midianites who were on the run. And finally, they reached the Jordan River, weary yet pursuing. It's a fair question that you might could have asked Gideon. Gideon, why not leave good enough alone? I mean, the victory that had been won was already a monumental victory. The number of Midianites that were killed were amazing. It was actually only a very small remnant of the army that they were chasing. Why not leave it for another day? Why not leave good enough alone? But I believe Gideon in his heart wanted to pursue this victory that God was giving him just as far as he possibly could. And so the sun comes up on Gideon and 300 men, weary, but still pursuing. I think there's a special kind of fellowship that develops among men at that level of weariness. There's a reason why the military pushes their trainees to that point of utter exhaustion. And so do many other kind of training camps. You can go to boot camp for many other things aside from the military. And one of the things that they will do is push you to that place of utter exhaustion. You build a special kind of camaraderie with your fellow 300 men, your battalion or whatever it is that you're training with, when you're all weary and faint, but you're still pursuing. And I have this beautiful picture in my mind of the Church of Jesus Christ as a band of 300 men and women. Sisters, you're absolutely included. A band of 300 men and women, utterly exhausted, faint with hunger, tired from the journey, every, um, every joint aching, every muscle rebelling against continuing, and yet they're continuing, weary, Utterly weary, but still pursuing. Can you kind of see those 300 men coming up to that river? Crossing the Jordan River was a, a major geographical divide. And I'm sure that some of them probably thought they were going to stop at the Jordan River. They were going to be content to chase the Midianites up to that geographical landmark and then stop. And then they realized, no, Gideon wants us to cross this river. 300 men in the sunrise. 300 exhausted men with their leader. Weary, but still pursuing. I think there's something special about that picture. And I'm praying that God would use that picture to encourage you tonight, to encourage me tonight, whatever weariness, whatever source of, uh, of tiredness and faintness there is in our hearts, that God would encourage us with the picture of the church as a place where, yes, we can acknowledge that we're weary. We can acknowledge that we get weak sometimes. We can acknowledge that the fight is long. We can acknowledge that we're getting tired but we're not going to give up the fight. 300 men, weary, yet pursuing. A few things that would have specifically caused weariness in Gideon's life. The strain of faith. The kind of strain that it takes to trust God and lead 300 men against the Midianite horde. That kind of faith wears you out. 
It's exhilarating, but it's tiring. Can you imagine what it was like to trust God to take on that huge army with only 300 men? That strain of faith brought weariness in Gideon's life. What about just being outnumbered? Do you ever feel outnumbered? Like way outnumbered? Yeah. That, that wears you out. It's challenging to be in the tiny minority. And the church of Jesus Christ, those who really walk with God, are in a very tiny minority in the United States and in many, many other countries. That brings weariness. The sleepless nights, which we've already spoken about, definitely brought just a natural tiredness into, into Gideon. We were just in Cheyenne, Wyoming. My wife is from Colorado, and we have two churches there in Cheyenne that we relate to. And it's still winter in Cheyenne. And while we were there, they had a snowstorm. And the family we were staying with plows snow for a living. And so my son, Nathaniel, who's only seen snow a couple times in his life, got to go out with the plow crew. And they worked almost 24 hours, like 16 hours all night long plowing snow so that the, you know how it is, so the stores can open the next morning. Wow. He came back the next morning weary, but also pretty thrilled. Something really neat about being up with six young men and plowing snow all night long. Amen. May God encourage our hearts to continue that in our spiritual battles. Also, the criticism of People who should have been on his team. If you read the verses just before the ones that we read, they crossed over, they're, they're crossing over the Jordan. They meet some of their, uh, their own Israelite people. And instead of rejoicing, instead of praising Gideon, instead of joining in with the battle, they were filled with criticism. Why weren't we allowed to join? Why didn't you give us some kind of important role in this victory? And that kind of criticism is uniquely debilitating. If you haven't faced it, if you're young, maybe you haven't faced it yet, but you are going to face it in your life. People who really should be on your team are going to look at victories that God wins through you and find some part that they can criticize. And that brings weariness. I thought about sources of weariness maybe that are, are other places in the scripture. Job says in Job chapter 10 that he was weary of life looking at where Job came from and all the way down into a, a world of physical suffering and loss, finally Job just says, I'm weary of life. Maybe you're a mom with a bunch of young children. You're not suffering as much as Job did. But I've heard busy mamas sometimes say, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting weary of life. Life is just wearing me out. Proverbs chapter 3 says, do not be, be weary of correction. Sometimes there's a lot of correction in our lives and it makes us grow weary. Maybe especially if you're a young child here and you feel like, it's 10 o'clock in the morning and I've already been corrected six times. <laughs> Don't be weary of correction. Genesis chapter 27 records for us that Rebecca was weary because of the sin around, around them. She said, my soul, if my son marries one of these Canaanite women, she was weary. You know, I feel that probably it hits me harder because I live overseas and I come back to America and I... I, I I'm starting to wonder if I'm still American. Sometimes when I walk around my country, I, I still think of America as my country, but my country is changing a lot. And if I go back to the late 90s when I basically left the States, it's a very different country. And it brings weariness into our hearts. That weariness must never be a reason for us to stop pursuing God's glory and God's interests. We can't just react by curling up. I was walking through the Kroger grocery store in Colorado two weeks ago, and this is the first time I saw this in America, but I know it's coming. The lady had a, a name tag on Jenny. 
And then below it, preferred pronouns, she, her. And I, my soul just, oh, God. Does that make sense? Do you ever feel weary by the wickedness of the world that we're living in? It can be a real source of weariness in our lives. It cannot be a, it cannot be a source of weariness that see, makes us cease from pursuing. Other things, you know, this is a land of... This is the land of everything. Same Kroger, I was walking up and down the aisle looking for something that my wife needed and do you know how long the, the um, salad dressing aisle is in an American <laughs> grocery store? Maybe that's just a uniquely missionary thing but I find myself just being just weary. I mean, literally, I don't mean weary from reading the labels. I mean weary from recognizing the kind of consumerist society that we've become. And I, I think in that grocery store, I don't think it's an exaggeration, I think there were 40 feet of aisle filled with salad dressing. <laughs> Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. But this is the world we live in. That can be a source of weariness in our lives. Galatians, sorry, Psalms chapter 63 speaks about being weary of waiting. Is there anything that you're waiting on? Do you have any prayers that you're praying and you're waiting? Do you have any promises that you're claiming and you're waiting? I am. I am. I have... Numerous things that I'm praying for, and the answer is not forthcoming this week. Don't grow weary in your waiting. Galatians speaks about being not becoming weary from doing the right thing. You know, there's a lot of people who do the right thing for a few years and then just sort of seem to kind of, I don't know, get tired, walk away from it. Especially for those of us who have adopted this conservative form of Christianity but didn't grow up in it. There's a lot of people who decide, this is right, I'm going to practice this. This is what God wants for our family. This is the way God wants me to live my life. And then after a while, I just kind of get weary. Galatians says, don't be weary in well-doing. If what you are pursuing is right. Do not become weary in well-doing. I want to take us back to the mental picture that we've been looking at here in the life of Gideon. Those 300 men, tired, weary, faint, but still pursuing. You know, the enemy was getting tired also. They'd also been on the run all night long. And somehow Gideon felt like it was still time to keep pushing forward the victory that God was winning in him and through him. It's time for the church to keep pushing forward the victory that God is winning in us and through us. It's not time to leave good enough alone. It's time to keep pushing forward even though we may be weary. Probably the time in my life that I was physically the most weary I've ever been. This is about 15 years ago. I was ministering on bicycle because most of my people didn't have motorcycles and there were no cars. So I felt like I should minister the way they can copy me and, and, and use a bicycle. But that meant an awful lot of miles um, on a little bicycle and a lot of weariness from pedaling. We had received an invitation to go to a group of villages where there were no churches, about 30 miles away from where I was currently living in a village. So a couple of us guys, um, American and Ghanaian church leaders, got together and biked up to these villages. And in several of these villages, there had never been a white man before. There were no churches in these villages, so we got the opportunity to preach the gospel to the chief of each community and to his people. An exhilarating experience. The only thing that was very difficult about it was that 
I'm not sure if they thought that I couldn't eat their food or if they were afraid to offer me what they had. I have never figured out the mystery of why they didn't feed me because my people, they tend to overfeed, not underfeed. But in these particular, this particular trek for about two days, they did not feed us. And riding five miles to the next village and then 10 miles to the next village and five miles to the next village without food makes you weak. In addition to that, most of these villages did not have um, hand pumps or what we call pipe water. They only had streams and ponds that they drank out of, and I can't drink that water. I I've done it before. It put me in bed for almost two months. So I don't drink that water. So we were hungry and we were thirsty, very thirsty. To go to bed at night and get up in the morning, there's no water and no food. Bike to the next village. No food, no water. You're not going to die in two days, but you kind of think you might. <laughs> I had a young man visiting from the States um, who had just come from the States, so he had a little secret stash of chocolate in his bag. Snickers bars at 110 degrees, they turned to water. We were in one of the villages, we were all faint. We were in one of the villages and I looked around, I couldn't find this young man. I just wasn't sure where he was. So I started looking around and there he was behind one of the granary bins, licking his chocolate out of his backpack. The other young, young man from America was laying there on this little log sitting place made out of rough logs. He's laying there, he, said, he told me, tell my mother I loved her. <laughs> I said, young man, I'm sorry to inform you, it's a lot harder to die than that. <laughs> you are nowhere near death, okay? But we were weary, and we knew we had to keep going because we needed to complete the loop and get back to the town where there was food and water and all of those things. Finally, in one of the last villages, the chief again did not feed us, but as a gift of welcome, he presented us with a bottle of African honey. And we were very polite and we left the road out into the, the bush a little bit and we stopped and we were drinking honey. <laughs> it was almost, almost magical as that honey hit our bloodstreams or whatever happens and, and suddenly that energy came into us. It was almost magical. Have you ever seen a bee? Maybe you children have seen a honey bee that somehow gotten off the path and you see a bee sitting on the ground trying to fly and it can't fly. Sometimes bees get lost. Either they're given the wrong instructions or they lose their way or the wind blows them off course. But my children like to find these bees sitting on the concrete around our house and you'll see them sitting there and they'll kind of try to fly and they can't fly. You go into the house and get just a a dot of honey or a tiny bit of sugar water and bring it out and put it in front of that bee. And that bee puts its tongue into that honey or into that sugar water and within maybe 30 seconds, off it goes. I'd like to encourage us this evening that the word of God tells us where we go for that kind of strength. If you're weary, where do we go to get strong. Yes, it's a great picture to continue pursuing while you're weary, but what if you're too weary to keep pursuing? Where do we go for strength? I want us to turn to familiar verses, but these are verses that the Lord has been using in my life. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Let's just place ourselves in the place of that bee that can't fly because it's just out of energy. Let's place ourselves there. Let's remember times in our lives where we've been that weak and weary. And let's read these verses um, from this perspective. Let's read from verse 28 of Isaiah chapter 40. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is weary. Haven't you heard that your creator never gets weary? Hallelujah. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might 
he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Psalms chapter 62 and verse 5 says, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. That's where we go to get the kind of strength that will help us to get up and fly again when we've run out of energy. It is to the God who never grows weary that we can turn. Haven't you known... Haven't you ever heard that your creator never gets tired? Amen. Now, probably that's a bit rhetorical because we all know these scripture verses. May God help us to know them in our soul, not just in our heads. Haven't you heard that your creator never grows weary? And as a God who never grows weary, he is a source of unending strength. My soul, wait thou only upon the Lord, for all my expectation is in him. Maybe you've had that kind of experience before where God's word was like a drop of honey to a bee that couldn't fly. I know I have. Been a lot of times in my life and my service to the Lord where I've been just really weary. And then God's word is just there, just, just like a, a drop of glucose. Whew. Let's read the verses again. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. It's a wonderful thing to know that you have a God who never grows weary. But it's even more wonderful what we find in the next verse, he gives power to the faint. It would be an amazing thing to just know that God never gets weary. So at least when I'm weary, I would know, well, at least my God's not weary. The one who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Well, that's great, but I'm weary. But the next verse follows up. He gives power to the faint. And to those that have no might, he increases strength. Verse 30 tells us, even the people that we think of as having boundless energy, youth, even the youth can get to a place where they faint or get weary. Even young men who are at the peak of their strength can get to a place where they utterly fail or fall. But those who have learned to tap into the source of a strength from a God who never becomes weary will be able to keep renewing and renewing and renewing and renewing their strength. Weary, but still pursuing. I want to go to one other Bible story tonight in the same vein. I want to take us to the story of Jonathan and the armor bearer. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 14. I want to speak uniquely and distinctly to this group of believers. And this was not what I intended to speak tonight, but this is as I walked in here and just meeting some of you and sensing what God is trying to do through you. This is uniquely what I feel like God wants me to share with you in the final 15 minutes. The story of Jonathan and his armor bearer has a unique backdrop to it. And it's not one that, 
the people of Israel would have been proud of. I just want us to remind us of the backdrop. Because I believe that this fellowship or fellowships, forgive me if I use the wrong term, this group of believers is uniquely positioned to be a Jonathan and his armor bearer in the conflict that God is fighting with the Philistines or with the unbelieving world or with the powers of darkness. I believe that you are uniquely situated. So let me paint the picture for you. Think of the children of Israel under Philistine domination. This went back and forth numerous times during Israel's history. But in this particular situation, the Philistines dominated the people of Israel. They had decided to leave um, Saul, yes, Saul and Jonathan as figureheads. Okay, we're going to still allow you to have your own king because, you know, for ceremonial purposes, it's nice for a nation to have a king. As long as Saul and Jonathan don't have any desire to throw off the, the uh, Philistine domination, we'll let you keep your titles. And the Philistines had also given them the singular disgrace of taking away from them all offensive weapons. The Bible records for us that even if you wanted to sharpen your agricultural tools, you had to go down to the land of the Philistines in order to do that. Because they would not allow anyone in the land of Israel who might be able to work with metal, who might be able to form weapons that would be used against the Philistines. This is radical disarmament. Forced agrarian society. Can you... Imagine the kind of disgrace it was for the, the Israelite farmers to need to go down and travel all the way down to the Philistine areas and show up at the blacksmith shop and say, I want my plowshare to be sharpened. I want my machete to be sharpened. I want my hoe to have a new edge on it. Can you imagine that disgrace? The Bible records that they did allow them two swords. And I have to think that two swords for an entire nation means that those swords were for ceremonial purposes. Sometimes when I look at the Christianity which surrounds us in America today, that's, what ex that's exactly what I feel like we've been left with. The enemy has won over the church to the point where almost anything we want to do, we have to go down to the Philistines to get the necessary tools to come back and just make a living. They have allowed us, Saul and Jonathan, isn't that nice? We still get to have our king and our prince. And oh, it's so gracious of them to allow us just two swords so that when we march out to celebrate on our high feast days, at least the king and his son have a sword. I kind of see those two swords as almost a mockery. Because to have only two swords for an entire nation is so far below what was Israel's fighting force in their days of strength that those two swords were basically an insult for ceremonial purposes. And sometimes it feels like the church of Jesus Christ in America today is largely at that place. We are allowed to have our Bibles and our Christian faith and it's kind of quaint and it's kind of a neat relic of American society and oh that's sweet, that's kind of nice. It's sort of like two swords for ceremonial purposes but that is not the way that God intended for the church to be. I don't know exactly why Saul decided to stand up against the Philistines with only two swords. I mean, I, I, I don't know why you would even entertain the thought that you might be able to stand up against the Philistines. But the chapter opens with Saul and 600 men kind of crowded together underneath a pomegranate tree. Can, can you feel with me how far Israel has fallen? from who they were, go back through their history, when they took over the land of Canaan, the wars they fought, the cities that they destroyed, the victories that they, they won. And now here we are, 600 men crowded together under one pomegranate tree with the Philistines in the hills above them. That's weariness. That's shame. 
That's a sad state of affairs. But in the middle of that context, two men, Jonathan, the prince, and his armor bearer, stood up and took the battle to the Philistines. Because we only have a few moments, I'm not going to go through the, the real deep details of that. But Jonathan said to his armor bearer, you know, young man, I think you and I should go over and see if maybe God will use us to win a victory. He has this incredible statement which just courses through my veins. He said to his armor bearer, he said, It is not with our God to save by many or by few. Let's read that. Maybe you can mark that verse if you're a Bible marking person. We're reading from 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint or there is no limitation to the Lord to save by many or by few. To Saul, 600 looked like way too small an army. But Jonathan says, you know, it really doesn't, it really is not in numbers. It's okay with there's only two of us. With our God, the numbers are not the priority. They are not the deciding factor. That's a powerful truth. Let every young person who feels embarrassed that, that radical Christianity is in such a tiny minority. Let every family, for that matter, that feels like, why are we so alone? Take heart! Let the words of Jonathan speak into your soul. It is not with our God to save by many or by few. The numbers really are a non-issue with our God. So let's go over and just see what God will do for us. And the Bible records that Jonathan and his armor bearer climbed up the hill. They set a little fleece in front of the Lord. They climbed up there, up to the Philistines. I'm guessing that the Philistines were not in any way afraid of these two people. He said, no, come up, we, 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 we want to show you something. And Jonathan said, let's go. The Lord hath delivered them into our hands. That holy confidence which comes from knowing, even though there's only two of us, we have God on our side. Oh, God's delivered them into our hands. An entire garrison holding the high ground and two men crawling up a mountain so steep that it was hand over fist over foot. Let's go. God's delivered them into our hands. And the Bible records that they won a little, a little victory, a very significant victory in a small field. But the Bible records that that small victory created this incredible sound which was heard by Saul and the 600 men under the pomegranate tree. Amen? Amen. The Bible also records that there were within the Philistine army Israelites who had decided to join the Philistines. And when they saw that God was winning a victory for their people through Jonathan and his armor bearer, the turncoats turned coat again. And decided, oh, okay, well, we were, Is we're Israelites. We're going to fight on the side of God and Israel again. The Bible also records that there were Israelites who had hidden in little holes and caves here and there. And those people came out and joined in the victory. That little victory of 20 people killed in a small field started a chain reaction of God's glory being restored. A chain reaction of the restoration of God's glory. A chain reaction of God's people getting involved in the fight. Jonathan and his armor bearer were only two people. And the number of Philistines that they killed was not significant numerically to make any difference in tilting the balance in favor of the Israelites. What's the difference of 20 people out of a whole garrison? And yet the fact that God was fight, that there was finally a victory being won, let three groups of people who were or should have been part of God's army, it let them come and join the fight. So I think if we can look at the scripture as a, a playbook or if you will, a, a book of military strategy, that's a strategy that should encourage your heart right here. 
and I realize some of you young people are just here for school and you go home all the more. Maybe you're only one or two. I think that we should draw encouragement from the fact that God can use Jonathan and his armor bearer. God can use a few believers in this city. God can use you to win a victory that while not significant in terms of turning the whole of America back to Christ again, God will use that victory and the victory will reverberate out in expanding circles and bring people who should have been fighting back into the war again. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ is very much like the nation of Israel, left with just a couple swords for ceremonial purposes, just this little vestige of what the church used to be in America. I believe that most of, the, of Christianity today is huddling with Saul under a pomegranate tree trying to figure out how on earth can we take on the Philistines when we don't have any weapons. I believe that's the reality of most of the church today. I believe that there are lots of people in the church of Jesus Christ today who have finally given up fighting and have just decided to join the world. After all, they're always winning anyway. We got to go along, you know, we got to go along to get along or however that, that phrase is. I guess this is the order of the day. The Philistines are in charge. And if we're going to better our lives, we're going to have to work with the Philistines. This is just the way it is. We got to be a little bit practical, you know. And there are many people who should be a part of the kingdom of God who have joined the Philistines. Then there's always that significant portion of the church that's just hiding in a cave, hoping it'll go away. God wants to use you. You as a young person. You as home fellowships. God wants to use you. As small as your numbers might be when looking at just the size of this city and certainly looking out across this nation. God wants to use you and the victory that he wins in your lives, in your families, and through you. God wants to use you to motivate those three different groups of believers to get back into the fight. Amen. God wants to use you to bring those who are hiding under the tree, just sort of disconsolate, sad, discouraged, sort of given up and just, just huddling under the tree trying to figure out what to do. There are so many Christians like that. And the victory that God wins in your life will motivate them to come out from underneath that tree and join the fight. It will in Jesus' name. There are many people who are fighting or not fighting but have rather joined in with the world, just kind of given over to the spirit of the world, just kind of going along with the idols of America. God will use your victory to make those people decide to come back and join the side that they're supposed to be on in Jesus' name. And there are people who are hiding in the caves, just just hoping it goes away. I just don't like conflict. I, I hope that my family doesn't get hurt. I hope that we can just somehow slide by. I hope in some way we can sort of get through this without any suffering. Those three classes of Christians, God can use your testimony to make a difference. And let them join in the victory that God wants to win. Weary, keep pursuing. Get a little tired sometimes, don't give up. You like a little bee fluttering and you can't fly, go back to our God. Wait only upon the Lord. There are so many things today that we can turn to to get little bursts of energy here and there. I felt like when I was studying this for this, I felt like God spoke to me. I, I've been reading research that says that these phones and things that we get on the phone can be like a little source of drug. I think the hormone is called dopamine. Is that correct? Does that sound right? And it gives you this little burst of energy. And when I was reading this portion of scripture, I felt like God said to me, Daniel, wait only on the Lord. Don't start taking drugs, and I don't mean drugs, but don't start going here and there to get little sources of energy where you might get a little burst. Turn to your father who is a God who never grows weary and he gives strength to the weak. And may God make you as the body of Christ here a group of 300 men and women who can look at each other and see tiredness in the eyes and and weakness in the joints and faintness and yet look at each other and say, let's keep pursuing. 
God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to share the word with you tonight.